Right, well, hello everyone. I'm Ed. I recognise a few of you in some people I just met today, which is good. Um, I'm going to talk about a project I did when I was a member of CU Space Flight, which was the case until I graduated last year. Um, and specifically, a project that we took part in with the European Space Agency to test some parachutes. Um, I was going to give a quick, quick introduction to Cambridge University Space Flight that people didn't know, but I think we now have a last minute talk on that, so that's fine. That's so, in the summer of 2008, I was working for my holiday job for a company called Vorticity in Oxfordshire, who were doing work on the ExoMars landing system. And ExoMars is a European rover due to, well, it's now been split into two separate projects, one in 2016 and one in 2018. But at the time, it was a rover that we were going to land on the surface of Mars. And to do that, you need parachutes. And I was working whilst I was there on some tests for the parachutes uh, in a wind tunnel. Now, the full-size parachutes for the rover were about 20 meters in diameter, which is enormous. And um, we had manufactured some subscale ones about two meters in diameter, which we tested in this wind tunnel. This wind tunnel is one of the biggest um, that you can uh, afford if you're not NASA um, in the world, it's in Canada. It's a nine meter by nine meter working section and the parachutes are attached to a pillar there and they get deployed into a stream of fast flowing air. Now the only problem with this is that on Mars, the atmosphere is about 1% as thick as Earth's and the parachutes would be deployed at a much higher speed. And this is a problem because what you're really interested in with parachutes is the way they open, and the way they open is affected by things like your Mach number, um, your mass ratio, which is a uh, ratio between the mass of the, your system that the parachute is decelerating and the volume of air that the parachute sort of holds, and it, uh, it affects the force profiles the parachute opens, and a bunch of other things. Um, and you really care about it because parachutes generate their peak force. Uh, during inflation, which is actually higher than their equilibrium force. So even if you deploy a parachute at a certain speed and you work out what the equilibrium drag force will be, the actual peak force will be higher. And that's how you have to stress all the things that hold it. Um, and it affects a bunch of other things as well, the high Mach number and thinner air. It affects, for example, if the parachute gets into a steady glide, or if the parachute starts to corkscrew, or some things like that. And people know about this, right? So they were then which I was also involved in planning, going to um, go to the nearest place on Earth that's like Mars, and that is the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And they do that by getting an enormous balloon and building uh, a large test vehicle which has about the same, it represents the full-size lander and it has full-size parachutes on board. And they take it up to the top of the atmosphere, let go, drop it back down, it accelerates, and once they get to the right kind of conditions, which are Mach 0.8, um, at the right kind of overall opening forces and dynamic pressures they deployed. Now about the same time I was working on this, I also had a day off work to work on Nova 8 HAPS D, which is the flight that we did with Doug Ellison, and that was the one that took that, I don't know if you've seen it, the 360 degree panorama of the sun over the earth, which is on the UCAS wiki page at the moment. So I came back to work being all excited, and eventually the conversation turned to the fact that we might be able to do this style of test with the little two meter diameter parachutes from here by building our own mini version of a drop vehicle. And that's what we did. And it was coined a uh, subscale high altitude drop test. So that was 2008, I thought nothing more about it. And then come the end of the university year in 2009, I got a call from uh, John Underwood, a colleague of Autistic, who said, oh, by the way, ESA have now agreed to pay for that and do it, so you're doing it. Um, and so Shadow was born. And this is what it looks like. So we have a test parachute here. Um, and then we have the main upper body of a vehicle. It's a sort of pointy vehicle because it has to fall quite quickly. And then on those kind. Um, we have the test parachute. That's deployed by a spring pilot parachute, which is the kind of parachute with a big spring in it that you can press that skydivers often use as their mains. So as soon as, you, as, soon as the skydivers release the patch, they spring out and get into the airflow. Is that a drogue thing? Yeah, yeah, it's a drogue. Um, and then, because this was a parachute under test, and therefore, you know, sort of pushing the limits of what it could take, we also had a very strong reserve parachute underneath in the front half, which we could deploy in case the main one failed for whatever reason. And that was also deployed by a backup spring pilot parachute. 
and then a nose cone. And we had a tether between the rear end of the vehicle and the front end of the vehicle. The front could actually detach from the back here to deploy the reserve. Um, and we could optionally detach the tether so these two parts could come down separately. And you'll see why we did that um, later. Here's a cross-section. So again, we've got the spring pilot here, the main test parachute. Underneath we have a high-speed camera, which is going to look up at as the parachute gets deployed. Uh, it can see the parachute being pulled away and deployed, which gives useful <coughs> engineering data that was mainly for pretty pictures. Because the really useful data comes from the electronics, which sat just behind the camera. And we had accelerometers, gyroscopes, pressure data. We could measure all the accelerations and forces and stability of the parachute inside. Uh, so but I'll measure those stability through the actually through the pedal itself. Yeah. The track, yeah, you can yeah, you can figure out the physics of what's going on, but it's based on the tensions from the probe. Um, and the whole thing was built around a large uh, you can't really see it in this picture, but a big thick aluminium bulkhead. Um, which, every, which was machined and everything was attached to that really. And then we had uh, the outer tube was made of uh, fiberglass reinforced plastic, um, sorry, fiberglass reinforced cardboard, and then the fins were carbon fiber. We had one flight computer in the main aviation display here with its own set of batteries. We had another reserve flight computer in the front with its own set of batteries. They could talk via disconnectable links, and both the flight computers could control redundant critical pyrotechnics so that either flight computer could cause <coughs> them trouble. And so the flight profile looks something like this. You attach the vehicle underneath a normal balloon with a pre-deployed parachute. You ascend like a normal have up to about 27 kilometers. Um, and then at that point we on the ground uplink a command to the vehicle saying, how are you doing? And it will say, yeah I'm good. And then we say, okay, now we'll begin the test. And what happens at that point is the main flight computer talks to the backup flight computer and says, right, I'm about to begin a test, are you happy? And the backup flight computer says, yes, we can communicate fine. And then the main flight computer says, okay, if you don't hear from me again in 25 seconds, something's gone wrong, deploy the reserves. And the backup flight computer says, okay. And then after that, this pyro gets uh, released and we start with free fall. Now we free fall based on a predetermined calculation of the time we need to free fall to get up to Mach 0.8. Um, as soon as we get to Mach 0.8, the rear cap is released, the spring pilot deploys, and it pulls out the sorry, I've got a wobbly laser pointer. Um, it pulls out the uh, main test parachute. Then it's deployed, and the whole system comes down under that main test parachute for a while until we get to near the ground. And then if everything's been fine, we completely release the front half with the reserve parachute and the rear half with the test parachute, so you get two much smaller, lighter landings. Um, if stuff goes wrong, um, in the nominal case, we start the test, it drops, we say deploy, nothing comes out, either the main flight computer's dead or the parachute deployed but then burst straight away or something. Within about two seconds, Either the main flight computer would have realized this because it checks accelerations and pressures and it deploys the emergency parachute. Or if the main flight computer's gone down, then the reserve flight computer will have not heard back from the main flight computer that everything was fine and therefore deployed the emergency parachute. Um, we also have another pyro above the pre deployed parachute. So if for whatever reason, say we fly outside, uh, the, we have very tightly controlled areas where we can fly, if it were to fly outside, we say, okay, this test not happening, we'll just bring the whole thing down safely on a pre deployed parachute. And likewise, if for whatever reason the balloon burst early, we could cut away from it uh, to get a, a cleaner descent. So, um, we had a couple of interesting bits of instrumentation. Uh, we had this rather nice accelerometer, which is a three axis one. We had to use a piezo accelerometer, because men's accelerometers couldn't quite give us the range and the bandwidth we needed. Because this parachute would deploy in a few tens of milliseconds, it wasn't a particularly long window that we had to capture data that we were interested in. So we had to upgrade to uh, this gyroscope, which had a much higher bandwidth and much higher range, which we would just sample the hell out of whilst the parachute was actually deploying. Expensive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we didn't want to lose um, And then we had the high speed camera. This was a real enabler. So normal high speed cameras are sort of, I don't know, um, 
20,000 pounds of the kind of spec we wanted. Um, and often they need PCI cards because they just dump the data straight out and they need to go into a read array or something. We obviously can fly a whole computer on there and they're too expensive anyway. In fact, the flight computers were worth more than the entire value of the project. Sorry, the um, host camera was worth more than the entire value of the project. So we actually found, serendipitously, Casio released about the same time this, which is a consumer grade high speed camera, which actually could, had really impressive performance. It could do 300 frames a second at sort of sub VGA, but sort of close enough to VGA quality, which was just about good enough for what we wanted. And then, um, unfortunately, there's nothing like CHDK, so we had to solder wires directly into the back to mimic all the button pressings. But it worked, it was really good, and that was actually about 500 pounds, which was, which was brilliant. Um, so we had uh, a few things, we had about two and a half months to do this, which was quite tight. Um, we had to develop an uplink, which we hadn't done before, I'm not sure if anyone else had done before, so that was tricky too. So the first thing we did was our, my friend Fergus designed the Badger Cub, which is kind of a test bed for this new radio chip um, to do uplinks and downlinks. And that's a, it's also a very tiny flight computer, it's a bit like Mark's mini nut that he was showing us this morning. Um, so it's based around, I've actually got the wrong side of the PCB to be useful here. On the other side, about here, there's one of those little TI uh, 10 milliwatt transceiver chips. Um, GPS comes in here, goes to the transceiver chip, which also has an 8051 microcontroller core and a serial port, so it can talk to the GPS and then it can just spit the radio out. And then it also has some I.O. so we could control the pyros. And we had continuity testing on all the I.O. which is really useful for, for checking the pyros were healthy. Um, especially before you say, okay, run the test. Um, we tested that. It worked really well. This is how far we got an uplink. So that's from the roof of the engineering department in Cambridge all the way out to the North Sea. I seem to remember Rob was listening to that one from Yorkshire as well, so the signal was pretty good. Um, so that was a good flight. Next thing we had to make uh, was the Badger 2 flight computer. So this is going to be the main flight computer. The Badger Cub was the reserve flight computer in the nose cone. Um, this was my first ever four-layer PCB. Um, I recommend practicing on four-layer PCBs before you do something that's actually needed in flight. Because um, it's difficult. Um, it worked first time, didn't it? Well, it worked with some modification <laughs> this time. <laughs> Because <laughs> of extra wires on this. Well, yeah, I, yeah I've done, I, I finished it at about 3 in the morning and then was too tired to do a design wall check and just sent it off to the main <laughs> um, And there are a couple of problems. I had a uh, cross track somewhere in town, which was stupid. Um, but it, I mean, it worked in the end. Just a few watches. Um, so, what have we got? We've got uh, a ARM 7 microcontroller, LPC 2368. We've got the transceiver chip. The entire schematic is completely lifted from the Badger Cup in that part. We have a high G accelerometer. Um, I've got to say, the, the really nice accelerometer we had is AC coupled. So we needed uh, some uh, DC accelerometers to um, reconstruct what actually happened from the AC um, part of the accelerometer. SD card. We actually used the full SD interface rather than the SPI interface because we were having to bash data really quite fast. We're sampling lots of sensors at about 10 kilohertz um, and quite high resolution. And that actually caused us lots of problems because you know, if you've ever played with SD cards, they occasionally go into wait states for a while where they say, oh, I can't take any more data. And you get sometimes 200 millisecond lockups. And if that occurred during the parachute inflation, that would have been really bad. Um, we have a couple of gyroscopes, um, a few other random sensors, uh, pressure, a magnetometer, uh, Venus GPS. Um, in the end, we got rid of it and put e-blocks on because they're rubbish. And then our own uh, radio front end for a, uh, for a radio GPS. So, so this this chip spits out the raw baseband IQ signals from GPS satellites, and then we were going to implement a software GPS, not for this project, but for subsequent projects. Because on the back of this, you can fit uh, a gumsticks computer. There's actually the footprints for it, which is the flight computer James uh, mentioned earlier on. And that, was, that had enough oomph to do the software GPS, but we didn't need it for this project, so we didn't do it. Have you ever moved from the, the, um, the side you've played Have you ever got that population of building? He was so up Henry, he's doing it in the States at the moment. Oh, yeah, he said he got it working, but I didn't know if he was using Badger 2. It wasn't Badger 2. Okay. I, I mean, Badger 2. There were, basically, we tried to put too much onto this. Yeah. Um, so we just thought, well, it's fine for this project, but yeah. we'll do it. Okay. 
going to Los Valle on Valley Round. So, really, the moral of this whole project was show everything working at some point or other to try and persuade people that we could do it, it was safe to do, persuade the various authorities, and there were lots of authorities and lots of insurers and lots of effort uh, trying to persuade them that we could do this. Um, so the first test was to check that our uh, method of deploying <coughs> the parachute was going to be okay. Um, the way it worked is we had, uh, this is the back end of the vehicle without the fins. We had glued into it an aluminium uh, collar, which had a chamfer which accepted the lid. The lid could pivot around a little lug on this side. And then over here we used uh, pyrotechnic protractors, which are entirely self-contained um, pushes, and they're basically like an M8 bolt and a pin shoots out at the end when you apply a current from the wires on the other side. And they, uh, the, I mean, on these ones, they were M8s, they had a stroke of about 12 millimeters with a force of 2 or 3 kilometers behind them, they're brilliant. And also, they are, because they're completely self-contained and don't emit any gas, you can just post them and buy them and there's no problem. Um, and they're about 35 pounds each. So they're quite a lot for hobby, but if someone else is putting the bill, it's actually they're really nice, safe, legal way of doing things. So the idea is, there would be a grub screw here, and the protractor is in the extended position here, but it, this pin would be flush with here, and then it would punch out, which would push the lid off, and then the spring pilot would be sitting underneath here, and would shoot out, now the lid is free. So we tested that, and you'll see it should burst off any second now, and the spring pilot shoots out, and that would get into the airflow, and the main parachute would be attached to underneath here and get yanked out. That's a solid spring push that. Pardon? That's just a spring push that. Uh, no, the, the lid, most of the force in the lid is from the protractor because they really do give a kick. You can see it sort of clears yeah, yeah. the parachute, but then the spring is pretty powerful as well. Um, so it's a spring push the parachute? Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's within the parachute itself, the spring. Oh, yeah. And that's just the part that's spring down the middle of the Yeah. Yeah, we'll do, it, we'll do it one more time so you can see. So there's, uh, <laughs> there's a spring within the parachute. Boing, yeah. Boing, you can kind of see it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's kind of yeah. So that's the camera that you were going to use anyway? Yes, yes, so that, yeah, it's another system of camera. <laughs> the yeah, so then the next test is, well, let's check. Let's uh, assemble this back together with the camera underneath and the main parachute here and check the whole parachute can be deployed okay. So we try to look for a wind tunnel. It turns out the only kind of wind tunnels you can use are things like the one I showed you in the first slide, which are way out of our budget. Because um, you can only have a, a certain percentage of blockage, of physical blockage in a wind tunnel before the results become invalid. So in the end, we made a gangster wind tunnel. Um, and we did this by putting the back end together uh, onto the rear plate, attaching that to a steel plate, attaching that to the back of a rig we bodged onto a trailer, Attaching that to the back of a Dodge Ram <laughs> and going to an old World War II airfield and trying out. Like take that that we fill on the back of the trailer and take it up under, under a balloon and see if we could do a static deployment. So not a free fall, but just a from standing deployment of the parachute. So that was to check the uplink on budget 2, the camera could take the temperature, all the other things like that. So this looked pretty at one point, and then it started raining. Um, so we had some last minute waterproofing on. There's a big load of padding on the bottom here. But the important bit is that there's a, there's a pyrotechnic here and that's holding the very top of the parachute down. Sorry, the very top of the test parachute deployment bag down. The test parachute deployment bag is attached to a pre-deployed parachute, attached to a balloon like any normal cab flight. So we took this lot up, and then we had to link the command that would say, blow this link, which means that this part of the vehicle from beneath the red line 
fall away from the parachute sleeve and deploy. And here's that video. Um, no, this isn't how it got yet. Um, I agree with it. Um, yeah, so there's, there's the parachute, oh, sorry, there's the balloon. We yank out of the parachute bag. There's no dynamic pressure because we went from zero miles an hour, so it starts to tumble a bit. Um, this was about 28 kilometers. You can see the parachute here, just doing its thing. Um, as the speed starts to build up, then the parachute starts to inflate and we get a bit of correction. Any second now. So this is all the high-speed cameras, so this happened uh, 30 times, no, 10 times faster. Uh, there's the moon. Yeah. <laughs> and there you can see the parachute's inflated, and there's the balloon we deployed away from with the pre-deployed parachute and deployment seat underneath it that we put out of. So that all worked nicely. Um, a quick note on real-time prediction and its value. Um, what's this happened? We're opening the command. So we're in the chase car, we're opening the command saying, okay, our prediction says it's going to land somewhere safely. Stop now. And the, uh, the flight community said, okay, bursting in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. We ran a prediction when it said go and drove to exactly where it was us to go. And this was the result. So this blue line is the prediction that was run, is zoomed in at the end of the prediction that was run on burst. This is where it reckons it will land, and this is where it actually landed. And that was from 28 kilometers. Um, so we were quite pleased with that. Um, and in fact, we just to show off a bit, we went here, we were parked here, and it was a really overcast rainy day, as I say, it was raining in Cambridge last minute. Um, and so we couldn't really see it coming down or anything, but because the cloud level was so low. But when the flight computer said, okay, look up now, and there it was. So you can see there's the main test parachute, and there's the vehicle, and it was a couple hundred meters away going overhead. Um, so that was all good. Is that water that I saw that? Is that a big pool of water? Yeah, we didn't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was close. Is that why you said it was a really good time to launch? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought we were not good time to launch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> With your prediction on that, was it improved by the fact that you were actually modelling parachute dynamics so that you knew you were the We had good information yeah. about our parachute, but the dynamic predictors should be able to okay. should be able to model. Mm. All you need to know is the ballistic coefficient. Right? Yeah, yeah, okay. you're, 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 yeah. You're investigating that anyway, yeah, yeah. really, so yeah. Uh, so once you get a good figure of ballistic coefficient, and I think we had fairly fresh grips on this. Um, yeah, once it starts to drop, you should not. Yeah. You want, you know, two or three meters. Yeah, within the yeah, first few meters, it should yeah. be. Well, the first few minutes, yeah. it should be fine. Yeah. Um, was yeah. that pirate one of my these tube ones? Yes, that was. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was sorry about that. Um, well, for everything official, we use the pyrotechnics, but yeah, that was one of my homemade ones. Um, Are you designed anyway? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the final test we wanted to do was, let's see if we can do the whole thing together, end-to-end -to -end test. So that would be uh, a free fall, uh, deploy the main out the back, split into two halves, land as two separate parts. Obviously we wanted to actually test it somewhere safe before doing it for real. So we wanted to compress all this, and we reckoned we could do it in about two, 150 meters if we did it at sea level. So just fall for a few seconds, deploy, reach equilibrium, split into two, land. And because we knew about balloons, we decided tethered balloons were the best way to do this. This was completely wrong. Um, the first time we tried it, um, what happened the first time we tried it? Oh yeah, we didn't quite, well, the first time we tried it, we had the vehicle uh, in a field. And I tried to uh, drive home to pick up, or drive back to the lab to pick up something. And then some cows broke in and started chasing uh, our friend Dan. So Dan, I saw Dan in my rearview mirror holding the vehicle like this, charging, whilst a hundred cows suddenly appeared the vehicle behind him. So I had to turn the pickup truck into a sheepdog and was kind of driving around beating at the cows trying to herd them back in. So that was bad. Um, the second day, I thought, second time, lucky, um, we'd inflated that we really wanted to get quite a lot of helium in this blue because we really wanted it to be lifted high and really lift this whole system up. Because I got 250 metres of tether line and I wanted 150 metres, so I thought it might need to be above about 60 degrees. Um, and 
I was sitting, standing there holding the balloon as it was being filled. And then, as we were just finishing up, there was this bizarre noise. It was a bit like a kind of thump. And then I was sort of looking around to see what the cause of this noise was. And then I noticed I was only holding a bit of filbury. <laughs> and the other bit of filbury was attached to the balloon. <laughs> Shooting up at about 15 meters per second. So that was a bad day. <laughs> and then... Yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was actually... The, that was about the time that you were doing that stuff with the sun, when I came and sort of grunted at you a bit at Churchill. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, yeah. Um, and then <laughs> the third day, third time lucky, as they say, uh, we set up in the field again. There's the vehicle. There's the sheepdog pickup truck. Um, helium, balloon. We inflated the balloon. As I say, we really inflated the balloon. So there's me. And there's all the balloon. Um, we had about 18 kilos of lift on it. In the end. Um, <coughs> things seemed to be going all right. The whole thing was being lifted up quite nicely. As I say, though, because we've had 18 kilos of lift in there, there's a great deal of free lift in there, although it had 250 meters at times three, so we had three 250 meter lines to it because we didn't want to go anywhere because that would be bad. Um, but actually, balloons are just not a stable shape aerodynamically. They shed vortices off and they bounce around a bit and they start swinging quite a lot. And I'm not sure if you can see this, but there's Fergus and there's me. We were trying to let the lines out. And there was only about six mile an hour winds that day. But it was trying to cut through our gloves, the wires on this. And we had three, each of the uh, tether wires was terminated with a 30 kilogram lump mass. And it was just pulling them across the field as if they weren't there. It was pretty scary. So we, we shackled them onto the fence. Um, and then that was about the size it got. It was about 60 meters. But it kept basically just bouncing whole thing sort of coming up and down. And this is how it spent most of its time. So the balloon is about 150 meters away from the person taking the photograph. But just really, I mean, a really shallow angle on the tether line. And eventually what happened was <coughs> it got up to about 180 meters and seemed to stabilize a bit. We thought, oh, brilliant, we can do it. And then we got a ref message from the radio transceiver saying, oh, by the way, I'm not talking to the flight computer anymore. <laughs> so, so as it started bouncing up and down again, Fergus and I started charging with the niece trying to find this thing. Someone described it as like lions trying to catch a gazelle, which I think is probably overstating it slightly. Um, and yeah, so we eventually grabbed this thing as, of, as it was sort of bouncing up and down, reset it, and thought, okay, it's now or never. We let it go up again. And um, it went up really high. Then there was a gust, and it came smashing down to the ground and took a fin off. Which we tried to fix with some tape. Um, oh, I'll say this is a bit of an in joke. We, I'm sorry if there are any Italians here. Um, we were working, we basically had some Italian colleagues, and every time something went really wrong, they'd say, oh, he's okay. So, uh, you know, that, <laughs> it just became a bit of a meme for us that summer. You know, like the, the flight computer would, a massive mushroom cloud of magic smoke would come out of the flight computer, and everyone would stop and stare. So <laughs> anyway, yeah, so we, we were sort of a bit fed up by that point. Anyway, so we thought, well, this whole tether balloon thing is really, although Steve made a nice profit that week, it's really not the way to do it. Um, don't make a profit. No. Um, it's, it's just not the way to, uh, they're just not stable, basically. Um, so we decided, we actually ended up doing what we should have done in the first place, which was about 10 times cheaper, 10 times less effort. Although it seems a bit extreme, it's really a lot easier, and that's this. <laughs>
I've shown you some of the prettier tests. There was a whole, you know, the whole time we just test, 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 test. And lots of things didn't work lots of times, and it, 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 was, it was getting a bit depressing. And, but it worked that time, so we were happy. How did you the helicopter for the day? Pardon? How did you the helicopter We didn't hire it for the day. So the helicopter is 400 quid for a pilot for a day, and then 1,000 pounds per flight hour. And we only did one hour, yeah. minimum one hour. So it's 1,000 and a half pounds. Um, the three failed balloon attempts were the balloons are about 300 quid each. Uh, the helium's about 100 quid per bottle, and there are nine bottles, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And helicopters can just... Yeah, 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 well, we didn't factor in time, that means you just... That would be easy to press But anyway, we've got a working system, um, plus with a few other tests. Here's a... You can hear the camera snapping away, these are the faces it was taking. So we start off with the vehicle hanging beneath the helicopter. You'll notice it's a big uh, gym weight there. Um, that's because if this detaches and this tether recoils and the helicopter pilot get a bit annoyed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then it just goes into free fall. Uh, this is a nice way to say, so there's a spring pilot chute which has pulled the entire flight train taut. The parachute deployment sleeve is taut and you can see the parachute just about to pull out there. Here it's been deployed. Um, do, you have, do you have runners on the line? Runners? Yeah. That slow the deployment down? Oh, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. I know exactly what this... Uh, reefing? Uh, reefing, thank you. Sorry, I didn't know that's my job. Um, yeah, no, we didn't have reefing. Um, because reefing is actually quite unreliable <coughs> and difficult to characterise. And it wouldn't have tested. It wasn't going to be on Mars, so it wouldn't have been here. They're very conservative, all the space agencies. They're all they pretty much all just do what work for Viking because they did a whole bunch of really expensive tests for Viking firing rockets up from balloons to get the really thin sort of Mars-like conditions. And they keep everything, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, the Curiosity rovers, they're all using the kind of Viking type data. Um, so if you were to suggest, suggest reefing, they'd probably all break out of sweats. <laughs> anyway, um, and then yeah, so once it's reached equilibrium, it deploys the front half and there's the front. If any, does anyone know Aeropon systems? The, the uh, aerospace toys. Yes. Anyway, that's one of theirs. Um, cheap. Yeah, about 30 quid. Yeah, really cheap. Um, and then it landed. So, uh, we proved this, well, people were satisfied the system worked. Um, so the big day came. Um, I won't bore you with fanfare, that's what the launch looked like. We wanted stability. Is everything had worked, and we were a bit dumbfounded. Um, I mean, it sort of worked. We, we said, okay, start the test. And it went, you what? And we said, start the test. And it went, you what? And so we cranked the power right up the road. <laughs> and we went, start the test. Went, okay. um, so it's fine. Um, I guess I should show you the video from on board. I'll show it to you again. It's the same speed as the other one, I should you. Same slow motion. And now I'll show you the slow down version. You can see something really bad happens. It starts off okay. You get lines taut and the thing goes out of focus. And then it stays kind of out of focus and there's a parachute in place so it starts zooming in. And what had happened, which we realized almost straight away, but we've never, one of the few things we couldn't test for, is the linear actuator which controlled the zoom in the high speed camera. Just went, oh, you're joking, when it saw 100 Gs. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so the nerve just went <laughs> down into the sensor, and the parachute just played it. That was really sad. Um, but all the actual engineering data was good. The gyros were fine, the experimenters were fine, the SD card didn't blank. Well, we got around the whole issue of the SD card blanking out. Um, but basically, that was it. That's the story. So we have a whole 
paper which we published and presented at the conference in Dublin a few months ago, which has all the results and the physics and the graphs and all the parachute bump. This is really just what we did, how it worked for us, um, show and tell. Um, so if you want to read the paper, there's a link to it on the website or I can post it somewhere. Um, but really, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's nice, I mean, if you're doing rockets and stuff as well, anything deployable, it's nice to get your entire train. I mean, parachutes are basically, the opening is kind of bound with you around an event. It's, it can be quite scary. And it's nice to control as much as possible by trying to get everything nice and taut. And therefore, when the parachute opens, it's already applying deceleration to the vehicle. Whereas if you deploy the parachute, if the parachute inflates before the lines are taut, all of a sudden you can have this enormous velocity difference between your parachute and your rocket and the stuff breaks. Um, so it's good to get everything taught first, and then you're in, you're in better shape. And the large fins presumably are because you're operating in altitude. Right? Yes, we needed the stability. We need quite a lot of stability. Now. There's loads of stuff in the paper on FDA analysis and squabble analysis and CFD if you want. Um, but yeah, it is, just for that reason. Did you manufacture the, the base, the uh, payload? Payload, yeah, the whole vehicle was us. Yeah, so I mean we bought from Malcolm Dillings. The, uh, from a rocketry shop, the base tubes, and the nice stone is an off-the-shelf fiberglass one. But we put everything together and glued everything on. In fact, you can see in here. I'm not sure if you can just see, but there's a, a new and as yet unpainted fillet of carbon fiber fillet yeah. on that fin, which is the one that broke the time before. Uh, yeah. Can you do it again. For about eight times the money, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I, it was it was fun and it's a good opportunity. But in terms of making money, we didn't. I mean, we weren't really in it to make money, but it ended up being about. Well, it was. We averaged eighteen hour days, seven days a week for three months. So by the end of it, we were just shot to pieces. Basically, we just had no lives left. All because we tried to visit it for summer holiday, um, which was a bad idea. But it was a sort of artificial constraint imposed by holiday. So I'm glad I did it, but probably probably not again. Has it been career in Boston? If you had not done it. Um, it's been useful, really, yeah. Well, I, I, I'd like to say we haven't seen all the fruits of it yet. Indeed. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, I'm, so I'm now working for, I suppose I should say, I'm now working for Bortisti, who, who I worked for before, and I'm working on the full-scale version of what we did. So this. So we're going up to Kiruna in northern Sweden in the next couple of years. We're building a 700 kilogram version of that vehicle with an enormous balloon to test the full scale system. Yeah. So that should be good fun. I shall vlog about it. More than 90 pounds of inertia and more than 90 pounds of inertia. Quite a few, and especially working for the European Space Agency, because they're very, very tight and everything. So we had to talk a lot to the CAA, we had to put lots of written stuff from the local air towers. Insurance was a really interesting one. Um, we ended up going with a, um, <coughs> a kind of experimental aviation insurance specialist in Texas, who do Armadillo Aerospace Aerospace, among other people, which is how I found out about them. Um, but there was a lot of to and fro, quite rightly, 
um, to make sure people are happy. Um, but I think we've said again, if we do it again, we do it over a range. Because the, the problem is, there's a lot of complexity added by all this redundancy and safety stuff. And it'd be a lot nicer if we could just have one flight computer, one parachute, one camera, and do it over a range. Do so over the supermarket range over the Yeah, sorry, yeah. So over somewhere like this in the north of Sweden, where you can actually drop tons without people getting upset. <laughs> would it be cheaper to do that as well in the long run? The cost Probably not. Right. I think um, I'm being recorded on the internet. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, probably not. These are very expensive, these ranges. And we were quite keen to keep it as self contained as possible to try and make sure it happened full stop. 